lawyer for Dr. Ford saying she does not want to testify on Monday. She first wants an FBI investigation. Now, I can't say everything's truthful. I don't know. Don't make the FBI your political animal to try to handle things the way your political party may want it to be. President Trump heads to the Carolinas today to survey the catastrophic damage left behind by Hurricane Florence. I'd love to see him here in town and let him see what a situation like this can do to small town USA. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has agreed to permanently dismantle a missile engine test site and launch pad in the presence of international experts. Hillary Clinton lashing out at President Trump. These authoritarian tendencies that we have seen at work in this administration could do lasting damage. I said that I would very much like uh, for us to set up a permanent American bases in Poland, which we would call Fort Trump. Could it be alive right about now? Ooh. I don't think the president would have a problem with poor Trump in Poland, especially with them paying the price and picking up the tab. That would be pretty good. No kidding. What yeah. did they, Fort Trump? Yeah, because they're concerned about the, the Russians uh, invading. They're, they've always been concerned about that. So I have an idea. I know the president hates paying for our troops to be in other people's soil protecting them. So why don't I build a fort? You just send your people. Right. Sure, exactly. They'll pay for it all. Yeah. So <laughs> that would be in Europe. But what about Asia? And that is a Fox News alert right now. President Trump has reacted overnight after North Korea has committed to denuking the peninsula. It's just one of the many things back on the table after Kim Jong-un and the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, met for a second day. Yeah, this was stunning news. Not many people were expecting this. Garrett Tenney live in Washington with the very latest. latest eh? Garrett, let the games begin, I guess. The Olympic Games. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to see North and South Korea announcing that they will seek to host the Olympics in 2032. Now, the Korean leaders are billing this agreement as a whole is a major step towards peace on the Korean Peninsula. On the second day of the summit, South Korea's moon said that Kim, for the first time, has agreed on a specific step towards denuclearization by promising to permanently dismantle a missile launch pad in test site in the presence of international experts. Well, late last night, President Trump reacted to that announcement, tweeting, Kim Jong-un has agreed to allow nuclear inspections subject to final negotiations and to permanently dismantle a test site and launch pad in the presence of international experts. In the meantime, there will be no rocket or nuclear testing. Hero remains to continue being returned home to the United States. Also, North and South Korea will file a joint bid to host the 2032 Olympics. Very exciting. Now, Kim also promised to permanently dismantle his country's main nuclear complex if the U.S. takes corresponding measures. Now, those corresponding measures weren't specified, but it's worth noting the North has demanded a lot of things from the U.S., including an official peace treaty to end the Korean War, which the U.S. isn't willing to do until the North takes more substantive steps to, de to denuclearize. Now, what remains to be seen and what we'll be looking for in the next uh, few days ahead is whether or not these latest agreements are enough to get the stalled negotiations between the U.S. and the North back on track. And that was really South Korea's president's main goal heading into this summit. Back to y'all. That's right, uh, Garrett. It is, uh, it is unclear right now what steps uh, Mr. Kim hopes the United States will take before actually uh, dismantling the primary nuke facility. You know what's fascinating is for a, company, a country known as the Hermit Kingdom, they certainly get our politics a little bit in that they'll blast the Trump administration, but they will not blast the president. Immediately after the meeting. These days. Yeah, now, these days. They used to. And, and this president in particular. And after they met, remember, they got rid of all the propaganda in the Capitol. I'm not saying this is a, 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 nothing but a despicable regime and, and a horrible, they've done horrible things and continue to do so. But there's something about this president and that meeting that continues to help out mm -hmm. and stop rockets from ricocheting over Japan and the West Coast. The art of the deal, Brian. Yeah, we'll see they where we go. Learn from to work here. together. All right, let's talk about Judge Kavanaugh, the accuser. Yesterday, we were wondering whether or not she was going to appear in front of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, she said she wanted to talk. The Judiciary Committee said, OK, we'll put you in front of us on Monday. And Steve, we, t we were wondering whether or not she was. You even yeah. said, I don't know if she's going to talk. I said, of course she will. Her attorney came out and said she wants to talk. That's right. We learned yesterday afternoon 
She doesn't want to talk on Monday. That's right. Uh, she had indicated that uh, we had heard that, that there was a cooperation deal in the works, supposedly, although the Democrats were not helping arrange any sort of contact with the lawyer or uh, any sort of a meeting on Monday. And then the attorney uh, released a letter and made it very clear she's not going to be talking on Monday because there has been no FBI investigation. We'll talk about the FBI angle, but first, here's a portion of her, uh, the attorney's letter to the committee it says as the judiciary committee has recognized and done before an fbi investigation of the incident should be the first step in addressing her allegations the hearing was scheduled for six short days from today and would include interrogation by senators who appear to have made up their minds that she is mistaken and mixed up so wait a second so she says then and she's been through a traumatic experience 36 years ago so she says it is uh, the story that she put out there when she contacted a lawmaker on the West Coast who contacted Senator Feinstein. And then, of course, they weren't in contact with each other. And Senator Feinstein makes it clear she's not sure if she actually believes everything this woman said. She has no way of verifying. So what's going to happen in six days that will help her memory about an event about Brett Kavanaugh, who might be the Supreme Court justice? How would an inquiry jog her memory? So far, we know it happened in 1982, she thinks, in the summer, she thinks, at a place she doesn't remember. Right. Well, she doesn't remember much else about that party because she was 15 at the time, maybe? Well, I don't know. The, the chairman, uh, Charles Grassley, said yesterday, nothing the FBI or any other investigator does would have any bearing on what Dr. Ford tells the committee. So there is no exactly. reason for any further delay. And for them to call for an FBI investigation, according to a former FBI uh, agent who was on the channel last night, look, it's not the FBI's job to look into this. Watch. Something may have happened to this woman. We shouldn't discount that she has a memory of something, whether or not it involves Judge Kavanaugh or somebody else, because it's been 36 years. Memories fade. But more importantly, this is the type of crime, a sex offense that's being alleged. It's handled by the local authorities. The FBI does not have jurisdiction. I'm talking about the process. If you have a complaint, there's a method to do it. Don't make the FBI your political animal to try to handle things the way your political party may want it to be. Right. The so FBI the is going to the, the FBI doesn't do criminal background checks into nominees. Uh, the role is not to issue a judgment about a nominee. Instead, you get, gather information and then submit it to the White House. What they did after they got the letter last week from Di Diane Feinstein was they uh, submitted it to the White House and they sent it to the uh, Judiciary Committee. And that's their role. Mm -hmm. that, that's all there is. Well, I think the, the public looks at it as this is a she said this was her account he said this was his account he doesn't remember it he says he wasn't at the party or has told other people he wasn't at the party she's saying this happened to me clearly something did happen to her but whether or not it involved judge kavanaugh unless she speaks unless we hear from her that's never going to be determined so um and then it's outside of the statute of limitations it's not a federal issue the fbi guy is saying so there's so many um it's just up in the air and so right. republicans are saying we don't have we don't have a choice. We've got to move on. We've got to vote. Comes down to this straight party line vote. The Republicans would pass him. Jeff Flake says, I got to hear from her first. That was before this revelation that she's not going to show up on Monday or whatever date they set. Bob Corker, or somebody else said, I want to hear from him first. And he tweeted this out last night. After learning of the allegation, Chairman Chuck Grassley took immediate action to ensure both Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh have the opportunity to be heard in public or private. Republics extended a good a hand in good faith. If we don't hear from both sides on Monday, let's vote. And that's key. Susan Collins, S Senator Mikowski, Corker, and Flake have made it clear they had a problem after these allegations come out. But this seems like a sincere effort by Republicans and the president showing the discipline he used in the fall of 2016 to get momentum to his campaign after he reconfigured things is showing it again multiple times yesterday. I want to hear her out. Right. I feel bad for Brett Kavanaugh. Let's see how it goes. Well, and keep in mind, Dianne Feinstein had this letter from the accuser uh, six weeks ago. 
She could have given it to the FBI right then, and then everybody would have known about it. And there is uh, Dr. Christine Ford. Uh, she is the accuser. It, uh, in the letter, it also said from her attorney, it also said she has received death threats. She's had to relocate her family, and her email has been hacked, and she's right. being impersonated online. Here's what, uh, here's what uh, the scenario of events has been portrayed that we understand, according to the Feinstein's office. Uh, Congressman... Uh, issue's office gets the uh, letter. They the issue the congresswoman from uh, California, Democrat, say, I urge you to go to Feinstein. So they go to Feinstein. Feinstein says, write up the letter. Well, he looks up the letter. They say she says she handed it to the Senate Ethics Committee. And after they would investigate uh, and evaluate the allegations, that according to Feinstein's spokesperson, they, they she was told the Rules Committee would have to sign off on it and they would have to validate Ford wishes to remain anonymous. And they couldn't do it while keep validate her while allowing her to remain anonymous and that's where it stopped then she came forward with it and then she came out did uh, dr ford with the washington post column as far as the timeline is concerned republicans have said they prob there probably will be a vote it'll be middle or the end of next week so we'll continue to keep you posted and watch this story but if murkowski and collins come out and say i'm not voting for her, the republicans aren't going to go ahead for a vote well let's see what happens a lot can happen and five days. All right. It is about 6-11 here in New York City and Jillian joins us with some news. That's right. Good morning. We're following a Fox News alert. So let's get you caught up on this. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smart's kidnapper will be released from prison at any moment. Wanda Barzi will walk free five years early after her sentence was miscalculated. Smart thinks Barzi should be kept behind bars, calling her a danger to the public and detailing the horrors of her nine month long abduction 16 years ago. She would encourage him to rape me. She would sit right next to me, like the side of her body would be touching me. There were no secrets. She knew what was going on. She was just evil and twisted. Smart was 14 years old when Barzi's husband, Brian Mitchell, kidnapped her in Utah. He is serving a life sentence. Terrifying moments in the sky when two Air Force pilots eject moments before their trainer plane crashes. This all unfolding nearly 30 miles from Joint Base San Antonio Randolph in Texas. The two men were not seriously hurt. The Air Force is investigating what went wrong. President Trump welcoming the president of Poland to the White House, hinting at a new American military base. I said that I would very much like uh, for us to set up a permanent American bases in Poland, which we would call Fort Trump. And I firmly believe that this is possible. I am convinced. President Trump is considering the idea, but wants Poland to foot most of the bill. Poland has offered to invest more than $2 billion. Let's look at your headlines. I'll send it back to you. <laughs> All right. There are a number of uh, Trump hotels, but uh, for Trump, that would be something new. <laughs> Thank right. you, Jillian. Well, the Emmys hit a new low going after Jesus. My mother's not watching. She doesn't like watching white award shows because you guys don't thank Jesus enough. The only white people that thank Jesus are Republicans and ex-crackheads. So how is mocking Christians okay? We're going to talk about it. Uh, and forget helicopter parenting. Lawnmower parents are the new thing. What the heck does that mean? We'll explain. Identity. Ratings for the Emmy Awards hitting an all-time low as the show's co-hosts went even lower, mocking Christians with comments like these. <laughs> My mother's not watching. She doesn't like watching white award shows because you guys don't thank Jesus enough. The only white people that thank Jesus are Republicans and ex-crackheads. So is that okay? Do you think that's okay? Were you offended by it? Here to weigh in on this is the host of CBN's Faith Nation, Jenna Browder. Hey, Jenna, good to see you this morning. Hey, Ainsley. Great Good to morning. see you. Okay, so what'd you think about Michael Che's comments at the Emmy Awards? It, you know, Ainsley, I thought you know, Hollywood probably got a good laugh out of it, but out in the rest of the country, I think it probably fell pretty flat. Uh, personally, I thought his, his comments were condescending and also pretty intolerant of anyone who is different from Michael Che, uh, Christians, or, or really anyone who's outside of that Hollywood bubble. What do you think, Jenna, if it were a different religion, if they used Muhammad, for instance, what would be the reaction? 
You know, I, it does seem like Christianity in particular is under attack. I think religion in general is, but maybe Christianity in particular. Uh, it's it, we see it all of, all of the time, Ainsley. And I will say um, that's why so many people have supported this president and this administration. They continue to stand for uh, people of faith. And and coming up here this week in Washington is the Values Voter Summit. And I'm told that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will be speaking specifically about religious freedom. It's a top priority for him and for so many people in this administration. How do you handle this as a Christian? Do you feel like the mainstream media or do you feel like some in Hollywood are trying to silence you? Uh, you know, again, it's a, it, it, it's a matter of, of really just uh, of standing strong, I think, for a lot of Christians and, and understanding their rights, you know, mm -hmm. freedom of religion uh, and, and going to vote. Uh, they, they spoke very loudly in 2016 when they turned out to vote for Donald Trump uh, because he promised to support religious freedom, to pr support a lot of causes that are important to people of faith. And so uh, that's how people can make their, that's how Christians and all people of faith can make their vote voice is heard is to get out and vote in these elections that are critical. There's an article in The New Yorker. It's a long article. I read it about Sarah Huckabee Sanders calling her the preacher's kid, the PK, uh, saying that she's Trump's battering ram. It also talks about her faith. And they they decided this magazine decided to tweet out um, one particular part of the article talking about her faith. And this is the tweet. It says Sarah Huckabee Sanders attends a D.C. church that is uh, that is an affiliate of Hillsong. Song, the global mega church that teaches creationism and intelligent design. Sanders asked if she shared these views, said, I believe in the Bible. What did you make of that? Yeah, you know, I read the article also, Ainsley, and I have to say I didn't learn a whole lot uh, of, new, of new information other than this journalist's clear disdain for the president, for Sarah Sanders, and for Christians. You know, Sarah Sanders, is she not allowed to have uh, religious beliefs. I don't think it's I, I don't think it's uh, earth shattering that she goes to church and and believes in God. And and this comment, this article, uh, was pretty uh, condescending and smug. Yeah, Hillsong's a great church. They should try it. Thank you so much, Jenna. Ainsley, so thank you. You're welcome. Hillary Clinton is back, and she's got a new mission: save us from President Trump. She says. What does Tommy Lahren think about that? She's live coming up next, and the countdown to the midterms is on. Less than 50 days to go. What do New Jersey voters think? Pete's having breakfast with friends there this morning. All right, some quick headlines. Please be seated. A Kennedy family charity is offering get-out-of-jail free cards for women and minors behind bars. The plan costs millions and would free hundreds of New York defendants, many awaiting trial for violent crimes. Isn't that nice? Law enforcement officials say suspects will have no incentive to show up to court with no bail. They want to pay everyone's bail right. if you're a woman. Uh, interject if you want, Ainsley. I'm going to get you back next time you have to read it. <laughs> and Marco Rubio slams Venezuelan President Maduro. He's feasting on a steak with a social media sensation. This chef made famous for flamboyantly seasoning meat. Well, the Florida Senator tweeting this out. I don't know who this weirdo Salt Bay is, but the guy he is so proud to host is not the president of Venezuela. He is actually the overweight dictator of a nation where 30% of the people eat only once a day and infants are suffering from malnutrition. Rubio once called Venezuela the new Cuba. It is, uh, Cuba's doing a lot better than Venezuela these days. Meanwhile, in other news, Hillary Clinton not shying away from the spotlight, appearing on the Rachel Maddow, Maddow show last night. And as you may have suspected, she called out our president. Got to stop him before the midterms. Watch. <laughs> what I'm worried about is that these authoritarian tendencies that we have seen at work in this administration with this president, um, left unchecked, could very well result in the erosion of our institutions to an extent that we've never imagined uh, possible here. All right, she's back. And so is Tommy Lahren. She's going to weigh in on this, host of Fox Nation. Hey, Tommy, great to see you. 
hi guys. Boy, do I love seeing Hillary Clinton on television. It just makes me feel so much better about the midterms, about 2020. Keep bringing her on. I appreciate it. Tommy, uh, try to be the interpreter here. When Hillary Clinton's talking about Donald Trump's authoritarian tendencies, what's she referring to? I have no idea. I don't know if by authoritarian tendency she's referring to GDP over 4%, unemployment at a year, a near 18 year low. Mm. I'm not sure what she's looking at here. But again, like all Democrats, she rests on the, well, he's mean and I don't like what he tweets. And I don't like what he says. Listen, once Democrats understand that we didn't elect this president to be nice, we elected him to get stuff done, maybe they'll understand his appeal and his accomplishments. Until then, they're lost. Well, the whole key of appearing on television last night is to do her best to try to get uh, the Republicans out of control of Congress. And here she is talking about how important this big November election is in another soundbite. If we ignore uh, the uh, importance of this midterm election and there is no check and balance, they, we don't take back one or both of the houses of Congress, then I think you will see even more of the dismantling uh, of our institutions uh, with uh, very dire effects. She's a wonderful speaker, but is her message getting across? Well, they couldn't pick a worse messenger than Hillary Clinton. I don't know why the Democrats can't understand that at this point. But what infuriates me most is when she talks about President Trump dismantling our institutions. This coming from a woman and a party that routinely talks about <laughs> abolishing ICE, that has no respect for law enforcement, border enforcement, national security. And she has the audacity to say President Trump is dismantling our institutions and traditions. Excuse me, Hillary, what are you watching? All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, a double standard. All right, so Karen Monahan, she's the ex-girlfriend of Deputy DNC Chairman Congressman Keith Ellison. She has accused him. They dated for three years. Her son went out and said that he witnessed his mom being abused by Keith Ellison. And then she doubled down on that and said, I didn't want to talk about it, but my son brought it up. Now you're blasting my son, so uh, I need to come forward. This is what she tweeted. She said, uh, no, they don't. I've been smeared, threatened, isolated uh, by my own party. I provided medical records from 2017, stating on two different doctor visits. I told them about the abuse and who did it. My therapist released records stating I've been dealing and healing from the abuse. She's saying she's being slammed by her own party. Meanwhile, the double standard here is Democrats are quick to judge Judge Kavanaugh. What is your opinion about it? Well, the double standard is the only standard of the left, but I have to tell you guys, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, independents, I don't care. I am so sick and tired of sexual assault and abuse being used as a political football and being politicized. We've come to this point where we're trying to overcorrect with the Me Too movement and we're taking accusations as truth, as gospel. I think that that's unfair on both sides of the aisle, but we are seeing with the Democrats, they are rushing to disparage and belittle Judge Kavanaugh, meanwhile, ignoring so many issues within their own party. Quite frankly, I think the American people are tired, tired of it mm. on both sides of the aisle, but especially the double standard. Yeah, but I think that there's a huge difference between a couple of years ago and 36 years ago between physical evidence and reports and someone speculating around what time and what year and what summer something happened. I think this is a huge story. Oh, no, it absolutely is. And I think that certainly when we're talking about abuse, we're talking about sexual assault or harassment, it needs to be taken seriously on both sides of the aisle. But we need to have some common sense when we're looking at these case by case. And what infuriates me so much about what's happening to Judge Kavanaugh is this doesn't seem like a true case of victimhood. It seems more like a case of opportunity for political purposes that should never have a place in the political process. And it's really disappointing to see it. As All a right. woman, I'm disappointed to see other women using it in that way. Well, let's talk about about seeing you we can see you on fox nation that streaming subscription based service that's going to be coming out shortly we're going to get more information on that on foxnation.com sign up now and become a, a super fan. member super fan of fox all right tommy thank you very much for joining us live thank you tommy thanks guys all right. all right meanwhile coming up straight ahead he was the number two at the fbi but he got fired for lying now andrew mccabe is hoping to cash in by trashing the president and the midterms just around the corner. Pete Hegseth is in New Jersey with voters this morning. It's Pancake Pete to the rescue. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, as always, bestowing that wonderful nickname. Have you ever had 
breakfast with three mayors. I never have. I'm, we're here in Monmouth County. We got the mayor of Homedale, Middletown, and Hazlitt. We're here in uh, Aberdeen, no, Matawan, Matawan, New Jersey. We're talking to voters. We may talk to the mayors, but we may also talk to their constituents. We're not quite sure. Lots to talk about today as we eat pancakes, talk about politics with the people here on Fox and Friends. Stay with us. We are back with a Fox News alert. President Trump is heading to the Carolinas today to survey the catastrophic damage left behind by Hurricane Florence. All right, his visit comes as flood waters continue to threaten entire towns. Griff Jenkins has been spending a lot of time around Pollocksville, North Carolina, where local officials are pleading for help. And Griff, today, they're going to hear from the guy in charge. That's right. Here in Pollocksville, we're just... 20 miles west of where the president touches down at Marine Corps Air Station in Cherry Point. And guys, if he looks out of the window, this is what he'll see below. This drone footage from the Jones County Sheriff's Office. Just unbelievable houses still underwater. And the resources in small towns like this, all in this area, are very, very thin. We spoke to the mayor, Jay Bender, here in Pollocksville. And here's what he hopes the president will hear and see. I'd love to hear his voice. I'd love to see him here in town and let him see what uh, a situation like this can do to small town USA. Guys, there's 16 rivers at flood stage, three more expected to crest. You've got 10,000 people in shelters and 37 dead. We went to a neighboring town, Trenton, and rode along with the vi volunteer fire department. The assistant chief, Kyle Koontz, taking me in a boat and telling me this. This is the actual highway right here. And We're driving on Highway 41 now. We're on Highway 41 right now, yes, sir. You'll see our fire department sign right up here that says uh, Trenton Fire District. Or just, uh, You'll see how deep it is. Looking at these road signs next. Here's a speed limit sign right here on the right. Uh, you can see the water's come down, you know, like I said, probably three feet. So yesterday you wouldn't have been able to see that sign. And more inland from Fayetteville through Lumberton all the way to Wilmington. Sections of I-95 still blocked and underwater. The situation is still bad here, and the president will have much to see. Guys? Already declared a disaster area, and now the president will see it with his own two eyes. Griff, thank you very much. Yeah, I, ho I hope they're able to bring him to places that he could see uh, some of the damage. Yeah. A lot of times they'll try to keep him back. Well, flying in, it's going to be hard to miss all of that. Right. Meanwhile, let's talk once again about the election in November. We are less than 50 days away to the midterm election. So how ready are the voters in New Jersey? All right, Pete Haig sets in the diner. He's having breakfast with friends and mayors at Town Square Diner in Aberdeen. It's it. It's Aberdeen, not Matawan, be clear. Uh, and New Jersey's known for its diner, so we're at a good one here at the Town Square Diner, just around the corner from my house. So I'm being a little selfish this morning. But a we're still lazy. Having, turns out there's voters here in New Jersey as well. A little lazy. Sorry, guys. My apologies. But I'm here with great folks in this diner this morning. We're talking about the politics of the day. And I'm here with Nancy, Gary, and Bill. Uh, and Nancy, I want to talk to you first because everyone's talking about Judge Kavanaugh and these accusations coming out now at the 11th hour. Um, what, what do you make of the politics and the swirl surrounding how the, the Judge Kavanaugh is being treated in the confirmation process? Well, I feel they had plenty of time to ask him those questions. Um, I feel like they waited till the 11th hour. Um, I feel that while she, her memory may be correct, She's also very um, unsure about some of her facts and to um, almost ruin someone's life about being accused of something that they may not have done because she seems to not really be sure about the party, if he was there, if he wasn't, when it actually was. I feel like if you're going to accuse somebody, your facts should be bulletproof, and I'm not really sure hers are. So when you talk about hearings and public testimony, does it surprise you now that she's saying she doesn't want to testify, I mean, does it, does it, your reaction to the whole thing? Well, I wouldn't want to testify either if my facts weren't secure. And, you know, it's a 35 year memory, so that's a long time. So um, I wouldn't want to go on, you know, under oath and, and swear on TV uh, to what may have happened or may not have happened. Yeah, that's a great point. Should should he be voted in, do you believe, uh, you know, it, it, should they delay this process at all? If he's going to be the only one to defend himself and she doesn't want to speak, then yes, he point. should be voted in. Bill, uh, your, your take on it as well. You have some thoughts. Well, I think they did it. The timing of it is 
strange to do it at the last minute. I think they just short fused the process to try to push it past the midterms in the hopes that they can take control of the Senate and stop it that way. So you see, poli I mean, as, as much as accusations should be considered and mm -hmm. looked at, you feel like there's a lot of politics behind this as well. I think it's politics based on the timing. I mean, they should have brought the accusations up much earlier when she was, they knew about it in July instead of waiting to the last minute. Here we are. We'll see what happens as far as the, the committee hearings and, and what the timeline looks like. But I in any other time, we'd be talking about this economy, which is as strong as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in insurance. You, you, you've looked at what part of this economy is most encouraging to you? Um, hoping that the changes in NAFTA are going to make a big difference. When it first went through years ago, uh, our company insures small equipment manufacturing, and it really took a hit back uh, when it was first implemented. And to see this administration renegotiate, I think is excellent. So we're hearing a lot of folks saying, wow, you know, we're, these tariffs and all this is so bad and disrupted. You're saying it's about time. You got to do something. It couldn't continue with the status quo. We couldn't continue that uh, way. Are you satisfied with what President Trump is doing in taking on the status quo? Yes. It's going to be a little rough because you got to convince people that there's got to be change, so I think when the dust settles, we'll be a lot better off. When the dust settles, we're not quite sure when that dust is going to settle, uh, but the folks here are encouraged by what this president is pursuing, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, shall I say, public and private conversations going on around Kavanaugh. People have a visceral reaction to how he's being treated, men and women. So we'll continue that conversation this morning, guys. Back to you in New York. All right, uh, Pete Hexeth from the blue state of New Jersey. Getting some good conversation over some cups of coffee. I know. Down in the diner. Interesting stuff. Thank Talk you. about good conversation. I, I was talking to Jillian before. She's in a good mood. <laughs> For a change, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, For yeah. a change. Right. Jeez. <laughs> Let's uh, t take advantage of it while we have it, okay, Brian? Okay. Good morning to you guys. A reality TV surgeon and his girlfriend are accused of drugging and sexually assaulting women. Grant Robicho was featured on the Bravo show Online Dating Rituals of the American Man four years ago. A California district attorney says he and Sarisa Riley attacked at least two women, but there could be hundreds of more victims. The couple denies the allegations. Disgraced former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe taking aim at President Trump in a new book called The Threat. In a statement, McCabe says, quote, I wrote this book because the president's attacks on me symbolize his destructive effect on the country as a whole. He is undermining America's safety and security and eroding public confidence in its institutions. McCabe was fired for lying to investigators about leaking to the media. An army specialist rescues a woman stranded in rising floodwaters. Look at this incredible video showing Matthew Hernan helping the woman out of her car and carrying her through knee deep water in Massachusetts. He says he was just grabbing coffee when he noticed she was in trouble. That woman calls Hernan a hero. And step aside, helicopter mom and dads, chances are you've already met this kind of parent. Uh, an anonymous teacher coining the new term lawn mower parents in a popular Facebook post. It's when a parent mows down obstacles so kids won't experience them instead of preparing them to deal with challenges. We want to know what you think. Email us your thoughts at friends at foxnews.com. I guess in a way it's just, you know, making it easier so your kids don't have to experience the tough stuff in life. You know, I, I think there are a lot of parents out there who do try to mow down the I'm obstacles sure, for their kids. I'm sure, but the tough kids. stuff just thickens so your skin. So there's a lawn mower parent, helicopter parent. Mm -hmm. All sorts of parents. Yeah. All different types of Something parents. Something new. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's go outside. Janice Dean joins us with a look at the weather, and it's a nice morning. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you? Hello. Yes? Hello. You got a birthday. What's your name? Isabella. And how old are you? 12. And you got a birthday, sir? Yes, sir. And yeah. Oops. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I'm 72. My Fantastic. Name. Are you guys happy to be on Fox and Friends? Yeah. All right, let's take a look at the maps real quick. I want to show you the storm system that was Florence is out of here, which is great news. Uh, temperatures a little bit cooler across the Northeast. However, we're going to, going to see the potential uh, for warm temperatures across the South. And I'm not sure why my maps are not working, but we're going to go back to the crowd so we can wave. And, you know, we've got all sorts of stuff coming up. we got great fancy cars. So you want to stay tuned? We're on Fox Square all morning. Woohoo! Back to you, Steve Ainsley and Brian. Thank you right. very much. Thanks. We got some performance, high performance SUVs. That's right.
Well, former President Obama taking credit for today's soaring economy, but if that's true, why did it take so long? Our next guest worked under President Reagan, and he's breaking it down for us. Plus, one of those vehicles is the top performance SUV of the year. Which one is it? Well, here's a hint. It goes from zero to 60 in three seconds. Janice could pretty much be in Central Park in five. Former President Barack Obama is hitting the campaign trail, and he wants credit for the booming economy. When you hear these folks bragging about this economic miracle, just remember when it started. Just remember when it started. Well, if it is President Obama's economy, then why did it take so long to get going? And why did it seem to boom after he left office? Here to weigh in is senior fellow at the Heartland Institute and former advisor to President Ronald Reagan, Peter Ferrara. Peter, good morning to you. Glad to be here. Well, uh, isn't the pre former president correct that the recovery after the Great Recession of 2008 did start during the Obama days? The recovery really got started on Election Day 2016. Uh, it took Trump's tax cuts and deregulation to get the economy booming. Before that, it was the worst and slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression in terms of jobs, economic growth, uh, median family income, wages, poverty rate, even inequality. Uh, we're all lagging throughout Obama's entire administration. Well, and how many times did we hear from uh, the Obama advisors and people on television about how this slow growth was the new normal, that we would, we're never going to get above 2%? It really just took six months for uh, Trump to get to 3%, even though they said it was impossible. And it, then already it's over 4%. And I expect it's going to continue to grow faster and faster, Reagan's economic recovery took, uh, lasted, in fact, 25 years. And so I think we're just, uh, we're just getting started here. We're not economists, you are, uh, but explain the difference between the Obama policies toward this and what President Trump did that seemed to make a difference. Well, the real distinction actually goes back to Reagan, actually, but it is a sharp distinction with Trump as well. Uh, Obama did ex the opposite of every one of Reagan's pro-growth policies. So Reagan, uh, instead of cutting tax rates like Reagan did, Obama increased tax rates on income taxes, payroll taxes, capital gains, dividends, maintained the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. Uh, these are the reasons why this recovery was so slow. Uh, instead of deregulation like Reagan did, Obama increased regulation on uh, energy, on health, health insurance and health care, on finance. And uh, so, again, that was the opposite of Reagan. Instead of cutting government spending, uh, Obama gave us the, the highest government spending deficits and debt in the history of the world. So uh, these are reasons why he had the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. All right. Peter Ferrara, Senior Fellow, Heartland Institute. Sir, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. All right. Uh, meanwhile, you've heard all about the allegations against uh, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. But what about that man, Keith Ellison? Brand new bombshell from his accuser. We bet you won't hear any place else. Plus, the top performance SUV of the year about to be revealed exclusively here on Fox Square. Which one of those five vehicles is it? Stick around. He is always bringing amazing vehicles to Fox Square, but today he's here with a big announcement. This hour he is announcing the top performance SUV of the year. Mike Caudell Good morning. is the Fox News transportation expert yes, joins us live. Now, usually, you know, we have five cars and then the last one is always the winner. Yeah. This time, it's one of the five cars that we've already shown people. That's right. right. Normally, we race through these cars right. as fast as we can, trying to tell you everything about them. But this is different. This is the Automotive Video Association's annual performance car and SUV segment. So we are actually announcing the award on an international level with press releases and all that stuff going out. It this, could be the Dodge Durango. It could be the Dodge Durango SRT. Great vehicle, super fast. Like WX3 M40i. It's the most affordable vehicle of the group, starting 
starting at $43,000. All right, this thing is like Dolph Lundgren from the movie Rocky. The this Mercedes. is the Mercedes AMG GLC 63, and this thing is fast, okay. super fast. All right, you've got Pretty two Italians, guy. two Italians. Now, this is the Alfa Romeo Quadrifoglio Stelvio Verde. So you've got uh -huh. Italian well, he is always bringing amazing vehicles to Fox Square, but today he's here with a big announcement. This hour he is announcing the top performance SUV of the year. Mike Caudell Good morning. is the Fox News transportation expert yes, joins us live. Now, usually, you know, we have five cars and then the last one is always the winner. Yeah. This time, it's one of the five cars that we've already shown people. That's right. right. Normally, we race through these cars right. as fast as we can, trying to tell you everything about them. But this is different. This is the Automotive Video Association's annual performance car and SUV segment. So we are actually announcing the award on an international level with press releases and all that stuff going out. It this, could be the Dodge Durango. It could be the Dodge Durango SRT. Great vehicle, super fast. Like WX3 M40i. It's the most affordable vehicle of the group, starting at $43,000. All right. This thing is like... Dolph Lundgren from the movie Rocky. The this Mercedes. is the Mercedes AMG GLC 63, and this thing is fast, okay. super fast. All right, you've got Pretty two Italians, guy. two Italians. Now, this is the Alfa Romeo Quadrifoglio Stelvio Verde. So you've got uh -huh. Italian.